Okay, so uh, hello guys. My name is Shuo. I am a software engineer from Databricks. And today my topic is uh, experience with hard multi-tenancy in Kubernetes using Kata container. Um, so starting from some introduction of who we are. So Databricks provides a unified and open platform for data and analytics. So we have our own data storage solution, uh, which combines the data warehouse and the data lake house as a single concept. And we call it lake house. And meanwhile, many of our services are built on top of Spark for data analyzing. And we also have our own machine learning products for AI and data model training. So in our classic infrastructure model, we separate our own services and customers' infrastructure, infrastructure. So we integrate with cloud storage, compute, and security in our customer's cloud account. And we manage and deploy those cloud infrastructures on customer's behalf. And also, we always provide services on top of multiple cloud providers, such as like AWS, Azure, or, or GCP, for example. So that's the traditional way that we provide our services. And recently, one of our revolutionary aspects of our products is moving our services to a serverless mode. So what is serverless mode? Uh, the meaning of the serverless is we migrate all the infra infrastructure management to our own account instead of like inside a customer account so that it eliminates the overhead to manage those cloud providers' assets from the customer account. Meanwhile, there are a lot of benefits for serverless, such as the service provisioning time will be super fast and the service will be super elastic. So with serverless, we usually can provide our Spark cluster to customer in less than five seconds. Also, since we take the ownership of the infra management, we will have some more flexibility to play with it and lower customers' infrastructure cost. So with the serverless mode, we want to use Kubernetes as our infrastructure due to its great portability and its extensibility for containerized workloads. And the Kubernetes is cloud agnostic and it has a rapid growing ecosystem so we mark it as our number one candidate. Each customer's workloads will be a single pod or a set of pods, basically a deployment or a daemon set in, um, in our Kubernetes cluster. However, like one of the main difference with traditional Kubernetes cluster is we requires the hard multi-tenancy. So what is hard multi-tenancy? It means that basically the tenants within a single Kubernetes cluster might come from different colonies and they do not trust each other. And also the infra infrastructure do not trust the tenant. So in this case, isolation of the data plane and the control plane are both very critical. And meanwhile, Databricks also deploys our own service into the same cluster. So we differentiate the service into two parts. The services, deployed by our team, our company is a first party services, which is in trusted group. And any pods that is running customers for close are untrusted. So the default security boundary between each pods are the container boundary, basically in the traditional Kubernetes environments. And the tricky part is in our environments, customer can run arbitrary code, like whatever they want. One example is like, the recent pr products that we recently released is our machine learning products where a customer can train in their own machine learning models in a shared environments with other customers. And Databricks has no idea like what customer is doing. So in this case, the container boundary might not be good enough because it has a pretty large attack surface and it's not safe for a hard multi-tenant environments. So think about a case if there is a malicious user uh, that write a program to break out a, break out a container, what it can do. 
So basically, like they can enter, basically they can enter other customers' container and access their data. They can attack the node kernel to affect the services inside other customers' pod, or they can directly attack the Kubernetes control plane, for example, or they can even like attack the database trusted services. Basically, like after the container breakout, they can do whatever they want. As a result, we need to build additional security boundary around the traditional container and pods to ensure the hard multi-tenancy. So one of the solution is using a cloud provider provided services, for example, like the Fargate from AWS. However, it turns out that those services cannot 100% fit our requirements. For example, like some of our Spark workloads requires to build a Spark cluster with multiple pods, right? And uh, each pod needs to connect to each other to serve as a single Spark cluster. So using the cloud provider services is not that flexible for us to build our own logic on top of it. As a result, we want to seek our own hard multi-tenancy solution on top of Kubernetes. So we do some exploration with multiple directions. And one of the direction that we explore to achieve this hard multi-tenancy solution is by using Kata Container. So what is Kata Container? The high level description of Kata Container is it is a secure container runtime with lightweight virtual machines that fill and perform like containers with the macro VM. It provides stronger workloads isolation using hardware virtualization technology as a second layer of defense instead of like a traditional container boundary, which is based on a software solution. So the security advantage provided by Kata is obvious. It is provides a VM boundary instead of a container boundary. However, like one of the trade off here is uh, when we use a Kata container, we require the cloud provider's VM has the capability for the virtualization. Basically, it means that we can create VMs inside cloud provider's node. As a result, not all the instance types from different cloud providers can support that. So with the Kata container, each pod will have its own CPU, its own memory, and it has its dedicated disks kernel, and it is pretty hard for customers to break out a VM boundary. So that is for the uh, computation security. And meanwhile, for the network access control, we rely on the Kubernetes native solution, which is network policy to shape, shape the customer's traffic. We also build a simple layer with a uh, cloud provider's native firewall solution, such as the network security group. It's just for the defense in depth purpose. So, <clears throat> This is a single node view after onboarding Kata container. So we use larger machine, machines to hold multiple Kata VMs from uh, different customers. Each Kata VM will consume their own compute and storage resources. For each machine, we also need to reserve some cores for the system and database services such as Kubernetes, Kubernetes, for example, like there is logging services and our metrics emitting services, et cetera. So as you can see in the right graph, the boundary between each pods are from Kata VM. And there are no shared resources between each customers as well as with our first party services. So along with the uh, Kata, this is the network policy layer that we built. So basically, a pod, a pod can only talk to pods from the same customer. So we build the network policy, basically disable network connections between different customers. We also disable the access of the Kubernetes control plane. And we also disable the pod to talk to any other cloud providers VMs, especially like the open ports of the Kubelet from like the nodes in the, in the fleet. And we also only allow a one-way connection from our trusted services to the customer's pod. So one additional thing that I want to mention is Kata Container makes the network policy more secure in multi-tenancy environments. 
So the way that CNI usually handles network policy is by translating the policy rules into either IP table rules or like the eBPF functions and apply those rules onto the host directly. However, like without kind of container, if a customer break out a container and earn the uh, host root privilege, it will be pretty easy for them to modify the IP table rules and then bypass the network policy. However, like after using Kata container, the VM boundary makes it almost impossible. Even the customer breaks out its own container, it can only access the IP table rules for its own Kata VM. The host IP table rules is almost immutable by any processes inside the Kata VM. So that's for the uh, how we build the network and uh, integrate with the Kata. So due to the high compatibility between Kata container and Kubernetes, onboarding Kata is pretty simple. It's just a special container runtime, right? So what we did is after installing the Kata artifacts on a node, we just add a special runtime name inside our pod spec. And also add the runtime handlers inside our containerd configuration. And then like in the runtime, the community can automatically figure out the right runtime and create a kind of VM as the pod sandbox. And function net wise, it just works. But is that good enough for Kata to directly run it inside of our production environments? And the answer is definitely no. I will talk about the main challenges that we explore the, during we explore the direction of the Kata container. Let's start from the biggest problem, which is the performance. So after onboarding vanilla Kata, we find out that our Spark workloads has 3x to 6x performance slowdown. This means that we definitely cannot directly use our vanilla Kata inside our production environments. So what is the reason that um, there is a performance problem? Why there are slowdown? So the nature of our Spark workloads are both compute intensive, memory intensive, and IO intensive. So by, uh, after onboarding Kata, it introduced an additional virtualization layer, and it makes all of these aspects more complex. For example, our workload will run on another layer of virtual CPU instead of like the CPU on the host. When executing instructions, the CPU has to jump between Kata guest VM and the host VM. We, we call it VM exit. And it takes time. And also, we have to rely on the Word IO protocol to provide our virtual block devices into Kata VM. So all of these factors will introduce additional overhead for both the computation and the IO path. So how do we solve this problem? Let's start from the storage performance domain. So Spark requires a pretty fast disk for the IO intensive workloads. As a result, instead of like using a cloud provider's remote disk, we are leveraging the local SSD on each machine to support such space. So in our current pod spec, we have a PVC statement to ask Kubernetes to handle this special mount. So without Kata, the vanilla story support for PV and PVC is just they mount that local SSD to a folder on the host namespace and then bind mount this folder into the container namespace. But after using Kata, the default way to support such scenario is by using a component called virtlfs. So this component virtualize a file system on the host and build a shared file system inside the Kata VM. As a result, any IO happens on either host or guest will be synced in real time. So this is similar to like bind mount uh, folder inside a container. However, like the performance is not that good because like during a single IO, there are multiple context switches between host user and kernel space and the IO packet will go through multiple file system layers. Like one layer is from the guest and uh, we have to go, to go through another layer inside a host. So these facts will introduce additional latency uh, for every single I.O. And it also shrinks the total throughput. So here, the technology that we use to solve the problem is called SPDK. 
So uh, what is SDK? So the full name is called uh, Storage Performance Development Kit. So it is a open source project which provides a set of tools and libs for writing high performance, scalable user mode storage application. So the most advantage that SBDK can provide us are first, it introduced a polling mode instead of like the traditional mode, like waiting the system interrupts to trigger the actual IO. Second, it can bypass the kernel's file system layer on the host and directly talk to the kernel device driver or like directly talk to the device itself. For example, like the NVMe device. So with these technologies, the IO path can be extremely simplified and the performance improves a lot. So the way that we integrate with SBDK, Kata Container and Kubernetes is by implementing our own CSI. So with our own CSI, when a new pod creation request comes, the Kubelet will first ask our CSI to prepare the PV for that pod. So during this preparation process, our CSI will talk to SBDK to create the necessary virtual block device, the control sockets, et cetera. And then it will utilize the direct volume functionality provided by the Kata runtime to record such virtual block device for that specific pod. And then the Kubelet will next call the CRI to create the sandbox and the containers. And during the sandbox creation, the Kata Shim will hot plug the virtual block devices directly into the Kata VM and mount that, bind mount that into the container namespace so that it, the, any, all the process can see such block devices mounting into a specific folder. So that is the whole process of like how we integrate the SBK inside the Kata VM and the container inside the Kata VM. So with the integration of the SBDK, this is the disk performance we tested. We saw that both read and write has significant performance improvements. And the SBDK disk performance is pretty close to what we have with uh, native disks outside of the Kata container. So besides the storage, we also did some exploration for the CPU and memory tuning. First, for all the CPUs that we got to assign to the Kata VM, we isolated them from the Linux scheduler. It prevents the scheduler to assign other host processes onto this set of CPUs. And also, we pin each Kata VM's virtual CPU to a dedicated and isolated core so that every single virtual CPU the process gets assigned inside the Kata VM can statically get assigned to a fixed the core on the host. So these two tunings can benefit us a lot from both performance perspective and the security perspective. It prevents the frequent contact switching between each threads on each single host core so that the CPU can have, be more focused on a single Kata VM's workflows and has a better CPU cache locality. Meanwhile, it prevents the customer share any computation resources with each other which further prevents some side channel attack, for example. And meanwhile, also we, we did some CPU state tunings, including, for example, like enable the CPU performance mode and tune the CPU power management side uh, option for like lower CPU latencies. And another interesting optimization that we explore is about the NUMA control. So, some basic introduction of what is NUMA. So the full name is called non-uniform memory access. Basically, like when cloud provider provides us a large instance type, it really contains multiple physical processors and multiple memory slots. Some processors is physically closer to some memory slots, which can provide the best memory access latency. However, like when a processor is trying to access a remote memory slot, it will have longer latency. So a single NUMA node contains processors and memories close with each other. And with a large instance type or like the bare metal machines called, provided by the cloud provider, the node usually contains multiple NUMA nodes. As a result, like when we try to do, what we try to do is to make sure that for every single kind of VM, 
The CPU and memory resources that are assigned to it comes from a single NUMA node. So in this case, the memory access latency will be short and consistent. And meanwhile, we are also trying to balance the load between different NUMA nodes on the same host. For example, like in this case, we saw that NUMA0 has two VMs, but NUMA1 has only one VM. And when there is a new VM, a Kata VM comes, we will make sure make sure the upcoming Kata VM falls into NUMA1 to balance the load. So the way that we implement such scenarios by introducing an unknown service is for physical resource management. The resource management services is responsible for bookkeeping the physical resource usage metadata. It will record which Kata VM is using which core and which new mass memory. Then every time the Kata runtime creates a new VM, it will first ask this service for a hint. And the hint contains a set of cores that we want to ping to this Kata VM, as well as, like for example, the NUMA ID. And then the Kata runtime will use this hint to call the hypervisor with additional parameters. And the newly created Kata VM will consume the targeted resource that we specified. So for the NUMA control, we also explore some Kubernetes native solutions such as like CPU manager or like topology manager. But it turns out that they cannot meet all of our requirements. For example, like for the CPU manager, the CPU manager can specify like which kind of VM use which CPU sets by specified inside the C group. However, it cannot pin each virtual CPU to a dedicated core. And also like the topology manager is not compatible with kind of container as well. So, we finally like decided to implement our own services, unload services, instead of like using a native solution. So with all the performance improvements that, that I introduced before, uh, we improve our workloads end-to-end -end performance from a 3x to 6x slowdown to less than 5% slowdown. So this indicates that performance-wise, Kata is qualified to support our hard multi-tenancy infra infrastructure. So in our exploration of Kata Container, we also identify some potential risks besides the performance. For example, like the noise neighbor problem. So inside a single node, there are still some resources that will be shared by multiple Kata VMs. For example, like the L3 cache, the memory bandwidth, and maybe like different partitions from the same disk or like the network bandwidth from the same NIC, et cetera. So when multiple Kata VM try to access these shared resources at the same time, it is possible that a resource contention will happen and it might cause a performance variation. So that's one of the potential risk. And another risk is the additional cost of the infrastructure. So, our original architecture is like uh, assigning uh, a single pod onto a single VM. And the VM size is just to fit the size of a single pod. But after using Kata, we have to use large machines, the bare metal machines, and we have to allocate multiple uh, Kata VMs on top of a single machine. So the scheduler by default will balance the load across the node within the Kubernetes cluster. And as the time goes by, some pod will come and some pod, some pod will go. And um, the node cannot always be fully utilized. Like the graph are showing below, some of the node might have some fragmentations. And these fragmentations makes more infrastructure costs from uh, our, like the SaaS company like us. So those are some concerns uh, and potential risks that we found during our exploration. And there might be some other problems, for example, like uh, when if we onboard a Kata container into AWS, we have to use the bare metal machine. And it turns out that the instance type capacity may not that large enough for the bare metal machine compared with uh, like the normal VM. And um, allocate additional, we, we, we also need to allocate additional resource in the node to cover the virtualization costs. For example, like after onboarding SPDK, uh, there are additional CPUs that will be used to busy pulling the IOs, and we also need to 
allocate memories and CPUs for the hypervisors. And some of our product scenario is not well covered by the current Kata VM, such as like, what if we want to do uh, some machine learning uh, data training model with the GPU, we have to device pass do the device pass through for the GPU inside the Kata VM. So those scenario is not well supported currently in a Kata upstream. So, but what is the conclusion then? So the conclusion is the Kata container is a great project to support the hard multi-tenancy increments. It provides the VM boundary instead of a container boundary and make the container, make the customer hard to break out a, break out a container. And by fine tuning the performance, Kata container can reach similar performance level to native container technology. However, on the other side, Kata container brings its own complexity. If we want to use it in production, some additional efforts is required to make the infrastructure as consistent performance and cost efficient. So that's all for today's share. And finally, I will do a um, short advertisement. So Databricks Serverless is now in public preview for both AWS and Azure. And we will short goes to GA. And welcome to shoot a try for our products. And it's super amazing. So that's it for today. Uh, thanks for attending the talk.